right. Well, it's 4.30, folks, and we really want to hear from you. So let's, um, let's get started. I, I will just do a brief um, agenda review and, some in and introduce some of the committee members, and then we'll get into um, hearing from you. So the agenda we have planned tonight is really just welcome you, introduce you to the committee members, talk to you for a couple minutes just about the work we've been doing and our charge overall, and then open it up um, to hear from folks. So uh, I'm Alyssa Sherin. I live here in Montpelier. I've been here since 2002, and um, I work. I volunteer as the chair of this committee. And uh, just to give you a sense of the other members of the committee, we have Abby German, Michael Sherman, uh, Dan Towell, Jen Duggan, uh, Justin Dreschler, and then two city council members, uh, Councilor Lauren Hurl and Councilor Jack McCullough. Uh, for the committee members who are on right now, if you wouldn't mind like giving a wave so people know who you, who you are, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, you can kind of get a sense of the committee. And the backgrounds of the folks on the committee really range from work in the disabilities and mental health communities to social justice work, to work with prosecutors' offices, um, to, it, to criminal defense work, work within the legal system, to work within, with sex workers and racial justice work. So really kind of a variety, a wide um, variety of experiences but also many perspectives and lived experiences we do not have on this committee, and which is in part why it's so critical to hear from you all. And uh, I also wanna just note that we are supported by Mary Smith with the city of Montpelier. Mary, we give away, thank you for all your work. And um, two Norwich interns, Morgan Edwards, who's here taking notes for us today, um, and Kennedy Mack. Uh, also, I just want to recognize that this this is recorded, and and Orca is with us today. So people should be prepared um, that 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 there this is this meeting is being recorded. Uh, a couple other details. So the city council created this committee, the police review committee, back in October, and our charge is to understand pol uh, current police practices, to define best practices for community this? safety broadly. To consider MPD, you know, the, the Montpelier Police Department strategic plan and desired state, and then to make recommendations on gaps. Um, yeah. Can we make sure that people are muted, Mary? Would you mind just muting folks who, who aren't speaking? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so then consider uh, the Montpelier Police Department strategic plan and desired state and look for recommendations and gaps to the city council about where we, in terms of our research and stakeholder engagement, might be um, areas to consider change um, or, or to replicate if something's going really well. Our, our final charge is to engage stakeholders in this process. So we have been doing a data-driven approach since October and have identified approximately 25 different uh, policing related topics of interest ranging from the budget to use of force to oversight, you know, citizen oversight to arrest and just there's so much in this field that that is um, that we're looking into. And we've been reaching out to various constituencies through service providers and also directly through written surveys, uh, meetings, interviews, with the unhoused community, mental health and disabilities community, communities of color, downtown businesses, sex workers, the police, the LGBTQ community, and others. And we have had the benefit of partnering with the Montpelier Social Justice Committee and their consultant creative discourse to gain insights through their affinity group work as well. So hearing from you today is part of our stakeholder engagement process. And we will also uh, follow up this meeting with an electronic uh, community-wide survey that we're gonna share really widely um, through the city's website, on social media, on Front Porch Forum, and other ways. So for folks who can't be here today in this 4.30 to 6.30 window, we'll try to get feedback in various other um, approaches as well. All of the feedback that we're getting and the research we're doing is going to culminate in a report uh, that we're going to give to the city council at the end of June. In terms of this mm -hmm. evening, this meeting runs from 4.30 I mean, to 6.30.
uh, this meeting runs tonight from 4.30 to 6.30, and it is obviously um, public uh, and recorded. I'm just going to repeat as folks are just getting on. You're going to all be muted during the meeting unless you're speaking. And if you'd like to speak, I would ask that you use the Zoom function to raise your hand. So along the bottom of the Zoom screen, you should see a button that says reactions. And then if you click that button, there's a raise hand function that you can put up. That will move, that will make you visible to me and I will be able to call on you and at that time. And after you're done speaking, you can lower your hand. If, if that is challenging, or uh, if you're on the phone and you just don't have that ability to do that, there will be points during the public meeting today where we will just unmute all the folks on the phone and say, you know, does anyone on the phone need to want to speak because they won't be able to do the raise hand function. In addition, if you're having any problems with this, go to the chat feature and chat Mary Smith directly and just say, I want to speak and Mary will get you into the queue. So those are a couple different ways that you'll be able to engage with us in the hearing today. And uh, we're going to, we're going to plan on how many people here are with us. We want to give you as much time as possible because we really want to hear from you. And let me just see here how many are on the screen. I think we're going to start based on the number of folks here with a three minute time um, approach. So everyone will get three minutes to speak, the committee members will then ask some clarifying questions of the, the speaker, perhaps, you know, if they have any, and, uh, and then we'll move on to the next person. I'm gonna go once through everyone, and if there are people who feel like they wanna speak a second time, or, um, you know, they have other thoughts that have come up and wanna share them, I'm gonna try to go through again, uh, if, if there, are, just to make sure everyone can be heard once. If for some reason you feel like even after that second round, assuming we get to it and we run out of time, that you haven't had enough time to speak to the committee, we, we want to hear from you. So I would encourage you, there are two different strategies we can, you know, that we can advance here. One is um, in writing. If you have anything to share in writing, we would welcome that. And you could send that to Mary Smith at the city. And Mary, perhaps you can put your email in the chat so that everyone has that. And also, um, if you'd prefer to be interviewed by a committee member, to have a committee member discuss with you one-on-one, -on -one, that's also an option. And if that's your preference, please let us know um, because we wanna make sure that we get your input. All right, that was eight minutes of monologue. I'm gonna stop talking now and move on to um, the process that we're all here for, which is to hear from you. So. Please just raise the chat, you know, in the um, raise your hand if you'd like to speak and we'll start the process. All right, Elaine. Let's start with you and Mary, would you mind unmuting Elaine? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Hi, I'm Elaine. Um, I live in Worcester, but I work in Montpelier and I lived in Montpelier for about six months a couple years ago. Um, I wanted to express concern for a couple of incidents that have happened in recent years that I know have been talked about in the community a lot, but I feel that the outcomes have been really disappointing and disheartening. And that is the shooting that killed a member of the community with a mental illness, a mental health concern a couple of years ago. Others will probably um, remember the man's name and the exact timing of that incident, but I remember that there was um, a memorial to on a bridge, Mark Johnson. Um, Correct. And, and also more recently, an incident in January with protesters who came to the state capitol and attacked a young teenager. And she was a member of my church community, the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, 
and to hear from her and her mother the disappointment that the chief of police placed blame on both sides equally a group of men attacked a teenager and that just seems absolutely insane and baffling to me that a teenager would um, be blamed equally for that kind of attack um, and that no charges would be filed against the men who attacked her. So I think that there are ongoing problems um, and I hope that others in the community may have <laughs> better, more educated ideas for how, how to address those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Do the committee members have any questions for Elaine? Okay, I don't see any at this time. Um, thank you so much. Thank and you. we'll move on to Dave Bellini. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Bellini. Nice to meet you. I don't know any of you. I'm a lifelong resident of Montpelier. And strangely enough, I know everything about state government and nothing about the city government where I live, partly by choice. I don't know who my city councilors are. I don't know who the police are. I'm disconnected, maybe in a bubble. I, I just don't know. So I was curious. I thought I would meet the police here and just say, hey, how are you? I am a lifelong, well, a career, 42 year labor advocate, 42 year state employee. And in my vast experience, I've had uh, the opportunity to work exclusively with people. And there was a time when I worked with all the Chittenden County or a lot of the Chittenden County law enforcement agencies. And I just give you my opinion, whether you're talking about police or, or anything else. Uh, if you want quality, it's who versus what or how many. If you hire the right who's, you solve a lot of problems. And as a labor advocate, it is my opinion that if you want the best police force, fire force, anything, you have to attract the right people. How do you do that? You pay the most and you have the best benefits. And that's what I believe as a citizen of Montpelier and somebody who pays too much taxes. But I want you to know residents, I mean, uh, workers in Montpelier, I will advocate for you is I think you get the best employees if you become the employer of choice. I don't know anything that's going on in Montpelier. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'll be retired soon and maybe have a little more free time. That's it. Thank you, Dave. Future volunteer here. Um, tell me, does the, do the committee members have any questions for Dave? All right, seeing none, Dave has just added to a volunteer list and thank you so much for your comments, Dave. Elaine, I see your hand is still up, but I think it's just a relic from when you spoke before. Um, okay, that sounds, looks like it was. Uh, let's go to Bogdan. Hello, uh, am I allowed to do a follow-up to Elaine's question? It is your, this is your time. You can do oh, okay. whatever you like. So uh, regarding the shooting of uh, the member of the community that had mental illness uh, a few years ago, uh, I would just like to circle back on that. Um, it is my understanding that the community knew about his mental illness. However, it feels that we left away a, an important part that that individual had the fake gun in his hands. So I would just like to open it up to, for conversation how should the, the police acted in that situation? Because from a distance, you cannot tell if a gun is real or if the gun is not real. So I guess it's a question for everybody how or what could have been done differently when that person had uh, a gun, uh, those officers, what could they have done differently in order to preserve life? Because after all, that is, the, uh, that is the ultimate goal to preserve life while they were looking at the barrel of a of a gun, even though the gun was uh, was fake. Thank you. Thank you. And we have been having robust discussions in our committee meetings around use of force. And so I think questions like that um, will continue to be uh, wrestled with. Do, do any committee members have uh, follow-up questions for Bogdan? 
All right, seeing none, um, we'll move on to Merida. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll just say I'm here as someone who identifies as an abolitionist. I think of abolition as um, the ways in which we can build life-affirming institutions. It's a framing by Ruth Wilson Gilmore that I really appreciate. And I, I'm really interested in looking at all community models and how they might be life-affirming. When I look at policing um, nationally, but also here in Montpelier, I'm not sure that's always um, the outcome, whether intended or unintended. Uh, I think I think that Montpelier, I've lived in a lot of different places. I've, I've been in Montpelier about five years. Um, and I think Montpelier has this opportunity to be a model um, nationally. Uh, I think we could do really creative, um, life-affirming uh, change to the institutions in our community. And I think that can start with policing. I also know that city bodies, governmental bodies are not generally up for radical change. And when somebody like me walks in the room and says, you know, I'm a abolitionist, that's probably buddy puts everybody's, you know, hair on the back of their neck up. But I think that that doesn't mean that we can't move incrementally towards a model that does less harm. And, you know, so for me, it's like, it's things like, um, what are different kinds of responders? And I know we have a social worker now, but what are different, what are the different kinds of responses that are required when somebody from the community is in crisis or needs help and support? And who are all the different kinds of people that we can call on rather than having police as the primary um, uh, group that we're calling? Um, you know, and I, I think that it's just, it's time to start um, thinking about how to take some of these steps forward to really making real change in terms of how we provide safety and build communities of care and support. Um, I also just want to mention too, um, my curiosity about this committee itself as a body and how effective it can be. Um, having lived in other places where I've um, worked diligently on other kinds of organizing efforts. It's, it, it can just be a plan that gets made and gets put on a shelf somewhere. It can also be a recommendation that's completely ignored by the bodies who are meant to take it seriously and put it into action. And so I would love to hear at some point a little bit more about um, assurances that this, this committee's work and the, what they're discovering will be reported effectively and will actually be listened to by the council and by the mayor um, and what kind of support um, people like myself need to be giving to this body to put pressure on our institutions to make change. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. I don't know if you had a time clock in front of you, but you were exactly three minutes on the dot. Awesome. Um, great. <laughs> It was really impressive. Um, in addition, uh, thank you for your comments. And I have a, I do have a follow-up question for you, but let me just open it up to other committee members first to see if they have anything. Okay, seeing nothing. Uh, Meredith, it is not your job to do this work. You know, we're the committee members and it's our job to, you know, do the research. Um, that said, you seem to have information on this topic and also be very passionate about it. And I'm just wondering if you have seen, uh, all, we have been looking at different alternative models for police response, particularly for folks in crisis or around use and, you know, around use of force issues. And my question to you is if you have seen anything that you think we should be looking at or have anything to share, we would really welcome it. And like I said, it's not your responsibility to do this. We'll take your, your comment. We'll, you know, double, redouble our efforts there. But if you did have anything, um, we would love to hear more or, you know, see the information that you could pass on. Sure. Um, I can't, I'm a little hard pressed to share with you right now. I do look at different models. I would be happy to share some things that I have been reading and looking at. I don't know if there's a, an email that's for the committee as a whole or um, a way to disperse it to the committee. That'd be great. 
There is Mary Smith um, put her email in the chat. And Mary, would you re-up your email? Because anyone who joins uh, later will not have the benefit of seeing your email. Uh, so maybe you could just kind of drop it in a few times throughout the meeting for folks that come later. But Mary Smith's email, she just dropped into the chat there. And that would be the best place to send anything that you have. Uh, a couple of them you know, models that I've looked at over the past week or so is just some de in de the city of Denver, some alternative um, response models have been just really interesting ones uh, that I know I've looked at recently, but I know there's other ones out there too, and we'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your comments. And um, who else? This would be, might be a great time while people are thinking if they want to raise their hand or not to move into, oh, Anne, is that a hand? Is that you? Anne's iPad, are you waving your hand at me? No, okay. Um, okay, so why don't we go to the phones then and just, uh, Mary, if we can just unmute the folks on the phones to just see if anyone wants to speak from the phones, that'd be great. So anyone on the phone who'd like to speak? Uh, Steve Whitaker, but I don't need to go first. <clears throat> well, Steve, why don't you take why don't you take the floor? Okay. Uh, uh, as opposed to getting floored here, uh, I, I'd like to let's see if I could. I, I don't know about three minutes. So, to serve and protect, uh, I have. Uh, I work in an advocacy role. I have had plenty of personal experience with our police force over about 30 years. Uh, many uh, improper actions were brought to the attention of an internal affairs officer. Nothing happened. I later saw him and said, why did nothing come of my reports to you about internal affairs issues? He says, I was about to retire. Why should I rock the boat? And that speaks volumes. Um, I have been in contact today with an attorney who grew up here. Uh, he is today, he's working in the Dominican Republic. Last time he was off to Vietnam, but he and his friend were, uh, you know, he was back to, to bury uh, his brother who was, you know, Carver from the AP associated press photographer. And he shared a beer with another friend up in the National Life Trail, the trail from you know the mobile station up to National Life. And he recounts a story, which I forwarded the complete details to uh, Justin, who can add them to the record with his permission, that of uh, being accosted by four, you know, officers shining flashlights in their face and, you know, basically making stuff up about enforcing complaints on private property and loud noises, all this stuff was totally made up. And that's not, that's private property, but it's national life. It's, it, you know, we're not in the security business for national life. Separately, uh, and much more recently, oh, that was back in, the same person had been arrested back in 1973 for leaning against the door of a restaurant. And the guy ran right up to him with cuffs, threw him in the clink and barely overnight, and the judge dismissed it the next day. But it really, that kind of stuff lingers, uh, lingering mistrust and uh, us against them. Uh, I've told you last time about uh, one of the homeless guys having, you know, he's drinking. Yes, it's the officers are within their uh, rights, not duty within their discretion to confiscate the open or even to cite him for an open container. Um, probably not the best constructive community building, but then to steal his other three unopened beers and claim it as evidence, uh, he is due, and I've assured him one way or the other, I'm going to get him an apology and a replacement of his three tall natty beers. Um, so that's Billy that many of you know. Um, the shooting of Mark Johnson, Mark Johnson was mentally distressed. He was in a panic. He was clearly, if you watch the entire video, he was trying suicide by cop as he got more desperate. He was being yelled at by officers with rifle with a rifle pointed at him. He was being ordered to get down. He was willing to jump off the rail bridge into the North Branch, which would have been the 
best possible outcome because he might have broken a leg. He might have got a little water in his lungs, but he'd be alive today, and he'd probably have been treated and, and have a new respect for how it was handled. And we could have waited. The officers were behind cover, uh, behind a, a cruiser, uh, a safe distance. He, he clearly couldn't have aimed at anything in the condition or mental state he was in. He was just waving this thing in the air. And they could have waited for cover until the beanbag shotgun arrived, which had to come because it wasn't in that car. I've learned since then they do keep it, I think, in, have more of them and have them in more cars. Wait till Washington County Mental Health Counselor gets there. But within about eight minutes of arrival, they put two fragment rifle rounds into his abdomen and, and killed him, assassinated him right on the Spring Street Bridge. And that's unconscionable. And I've, I've raised this issue with... Same officer broke a lady's ribs over a tussle of defending her daughter. Um, so, and recently, uh, an officer coming up and knocking on the window saying, you can't sleep in your car. This is just a state law, statute 0106. I'm like, uh, pardon me, but there's no statutes that start with a zero. It seemed give her the benefit of the doubt, meant 1106, but that's on state highways at designated lots, not in city parking lots down by the river that are leased from a private party. So basically just going around harassing people for no reason and then falsely claiming statutes, that same officer later lied on an affidavit regarding the toilet signs that I, public toilet signs I posted around town. Both of these issues were brought, oh, the video of that incident of sleeping in the car was turned up missing. It's marked on the report as it was videoed, and now the video is missing. I've done a recent public records request. All these offices have been brought off. These incidents have been brought to the attention of the chief, and what are you going to do about it? Not a thing. Not a word. Not a response. Not a question. Nothing. That is telling. The same chief when I said, are you going to ask for the full file on the Mark Johnson shooting so you would know whether you've got a dangerous officer who needs to be disarmed on your force? He hasn't even asked for that whole file. It's taken me over a year, and I still don't have the whole file, getting it in dribbles out of the Department of Public Safety. Stephen, let me just jump in, um, if you don't mind. We're about four and a half minutes in, and I see other people have their hands up. Uh, if, if Thank you for what you've offered so far, and I am sure we will be able to get back to you to continue. Um, but I sure, also want to make patient. sure that I'll, I'll I'll, I'll mute myself and await another opportunity. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. Anne, you're up. Oh, I'm sorry. Did people have clarifying questions or follow-up questions for Stephen? I want to make sure. Okay. And no, I'm just giving a minute to see if I see anyone on my screen with a burning question for you. Okay. Seeing none, um, I, w I did promise we would go to the next person on the phone uh, before we got, got to you, and I... Uh, so I just want to unmute the phones for a minute and because I see there's another person on the phone, if they would like to speak, um, this would be a great time. Okay, Hear, hearing no one else on the phone and now it's really your turn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Since you called on me, I do have a question. Would you mind talking a little about the formation of the committee? Uh, are you appointed? Are you volunteers? And in what way are in what ways are you representative? Thank you. Sure. I would love to have the city councilors on the call if you wouldn't mind talk about how this committee was formed because I know you were you were there and uh, and if you want to take the second half of the answer that's great or otherwise I'd be happy to answer that. I can jump in. Uh, so I'm Lauren Hurl. I'm a, a district one city councilor and um, really this committee was formed. Um, so starting kind of over the summer, the, the council had passed a, a resolution condemning police brutality. And we were hearing regularly from uh, community members about policing and just, you know, we all know what's happening 
with the conversations nationally around policing. Um, we also had a new police chief who had done a, an assessment of kind of the state of the department and made recommendations for a, a vision and kind of values and, and state of the state. And so um, the, the council um, really working with city, the city manager, city staff, and the, the police chief as well was interested in a community group to look at these, this vision and values together and the, um, the, the charge, uh, Alyssa, as our chair probably has it right in front of her, um, but we wanted to look at, you know, what were policies, what were um, the whole kind of suite of, of issues that were raised in front of um, city council uh, to look at you know, how the Montpelier Police Department is doing. And so the council established um, established a committee and I think I would turn it over to Alyssa to, to walk through, because uh, I think she had prepared the kind of uh, the range, but we wanted to have uh, two uh, counselors on the committee. So to, to one of the comments earlier around is, is, the, is this gonna go sit on a shelf or is this something that the council is gonna be really actively engaged in? I, you know, my sense, and I know that at least at least four of the six counselors are are with us tonight, maybe more. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of interest and a lot of, you know, really wanting to um, to to act on what we come up with as a committee. Um, and and so, you know, we're obviously in that process of developing uh, recommendations and have a report due at the end of June together. Um, but the people were, um, there was a whole application process and people were appointed by city council to participate, um, trying to, um, you know, represent a, a breadth of expertise and perspective. Um, and also knowing that we would need to get a lot more input from community members through events like tonight and a lot of direct outreach that is going on um, beyond this evening to, to hear from a lot of people. So. Happy to answer more details or a different thread if I didn't hit on what you were trying to understand, Anne, from the kind of formation of it, or Jack, if you wanted to supplement or amend anything I said, feel free. I, I think you did it, gave a good uh, good summary of how we got to where we are today. Um, I think that uh, the council knew that uh, we were asking people to commit a substantial amount of uh, time and effort into, into this process. And um, I'm quite confident that the uh, council is not going to receive a report and uh, ignore it once it's received. And in terms of the, um, the types of backgrounds folks have, Dan, uh, a committee member, I see uh, you have your hand up. Were you thinking, Dan, of addressing that answer or did you want to speak on something else? Because if not, I'll answer the second half of the question and then come over to you. You're muted. Actually, I would in fact like to address part of the second part of that answer as well as address some of the earlier comments. Um, both uh, uh, Bogdan, Elaine, and Stephen all talked about issues relating to mental health. And I just, um, I wanted to just make sure everybody on the call was aware that um, there are people on the committee who are, who are very committed to, um, to exploring the intersection between uh, the law enforcement and mental health and looking for you know optimal ways of handling situations, particularly crisis. And I'll use myself as an example. I am I'm an individual. I'm a, uh, I do mental health advocacy work. I also am a, uh, do uh, work and do volunteer as a peer support worker. I myself have dealt with a mental health condition for most of my adult life, and uh, I am very passionate about this the issue of trying not only for the for the, uh, the mental health community, communities, but all of the marginalized communities that intersect with law enforcement. And, uh, you know, I think a, a number, of, number of you have raised issues like the Mark Johnson shooting and in, uh, individual interactions with police. And, and as Alyssa mentioned, there are a number of models, a number of things that have been happening um, here, here in the United States that we've begun to look at. And, uh, and I feel, as a committee, we are definitely committed at, look, at looking at, at various ways to address those issues. And we have representatives 
on the committee uh, with backgrounds and interest to um, make sure that we do the absolute best we can in, in terms of public safety and public health. Thank you, Dan. And then just to round out um, that answer too. So there are folks here who also have done work historically and with the unhoused community or the disabilities community. Uh, we, we have done a lot of outreach um, through partnerships and individually also um, to communities of color, um, downtown businesses. We have folks here who, who have expertise um, you know, engaging and supporting sex workers or um, engage or being part of or engaging with the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, we have folks who are, have worked with uh, prosecutors offices and folks who've worked with crim on the criminal defense side. Uh, and uh, so, you know, a real range. And then folks who've worked on social, social justice issues for decades in, in Montpelier. Uh, so it's a real range of experiences that people are people are bringing to this. Um, and thank you so much, Anne, because I did call on you, and then you did raise your hand for speaking up. Um, Donna, we're coming over to you, and then we're going to go over to Michael. Uh, thank you. I'm also on the city council, and when you were asking for us our response, I just wanted to add that there has been this attitude since Obama's 21st century policing in 2014 to really start creating a partnership for the community. And I see that from there, we went into safe catch in 2016, thanks to Chief Fakus and really guiding us to become more interested That's in treatment smash success. for drug addiction than, than punishment. And I think this is another extension of that. And it's a bold step, but I think it's a continuum of where the community has been trying to reach out and change. And so I feel this is an important uh, essential step and I really appreciate all the people coming to talk about it. And I would love to hear more from the committee about what you have been hearing and discussing also if there's time tonight. Um, thank you. Thank you. I would love to talk about that, but I also feel like committee members have been sort of talking a lot. And so, Don, if you don't mind, I'll put in a pin in that for a little bit, a little while, and so we can hear from more folks. Okay, over to Michael. Hi, um, I just want to add that I'm a member of the committee, and I just want to add that one of our goals in doing our research was to look beyond just Montpelier. So each of us on the committee has taken an, an assignment of one or two or more of the topics that, that we that Alyssa started to mention, um, and and in and in every case that I know of, we're really looking just we're looking beyond Montpelier. We're looking for best practices around the country in within the state, um, and we're not confining ourselves to just what we know about here. We are really trying to consult and look at and read and study and evaluate. Uh, national trends, uh, national reports, regional reports. So um, it, it is taking a broader view than just what we know of in, in first hand or second hand here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Stella, over to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um... Hi everybody, my name is Stella. I'm a trans and gender expansive person. I'm white, I live with mental illness and chronic illness and I grew up in Montpelier. Um, and I wanna start by just naming that I, it is concerning to me that this committee is made up of people who claim to advocate for issues but none of whom are members of impacted communities. And I think that it is important and critical in work for change and justice in our communities. We center marginalized communities and that cannot be done when the committee is made up entirely or almost entirely of people who are not a member of any marginalized community. Um, so that I just wanted to name that that is concerning for me and I think this committee should consider um, the impact that that's going to have on the results of your findings. Um, I, um, I would like to just speak about that I would like for this committee to seriously consider divesting from police and investing in affordable housing. 
mental health services that are accessible, arts, reparations efforts to Black and Indigenous community members as entry points for true community care and safety, and solidarity and aid rather than police and violence. A 2018 FBI study revealed that 95% of crimes committed in Montpelier are nonviolent, so-called crimes of necessity. Police cannot address the underlying causes of these so-called crimes. They can only react after the incident. Investing in community services will reduce the desperation that causes these so-called crimes, thereby improving actual public well-being and safety. A significant divestment from the MPD and reinvestment in community care will still leave more than enough financial resources for the average of 15 annual calls for so-called dangerous crimes in Montpelier. In the past, Vermont has taken positive action with regards to demanding change in police behavior. In 2018, Vermont responded to calls of extreme concern from Montpelier residents and beyond about the deadly exchanges in which Vermont police were taking taxpayer money to travel on all expenses paid trips to Israel to learn tactics of maiming and loopholes in, in international law that allowed for extreme and great violence. They ended this form, they fully and formally ended the deadly exchange in response to community calls shift and chose to focus on fair and impartial policing policies in Montpelier and Vermont. We are being called to take long overdue action to divest from the Montpelier Police Department and invest in community safety measures that are proactive, sustainable, and transformational. We can no longer lean on practices that are rooted in racism and colonialism during these times of crisis. We must creatively and effectively change our tactics to meet these times. Um, I would like to suggest that this committee take an actionable step now of looking at what is happening in Burlington um, and specifically the response, the letters of response from um, council members and from Burlington uh, Police Department uh, accountability group that came out of Battery Street Park. There are letters of response to the public, uh, the police commission that was made from Mira Weinberger to Kyle Dodson. Um, and I can send I'll send those documents in the email as well. I just wanted to name that now. Um, and then I also want to suggest that this committee seriously interrogate the history of policing in the US, which began as slave patrols and slave catchers, and to consider um, whether we believe it is possible that reform and, um, and, and like half-hearted responses are adequate in response to the centuries of colonial violence that we are facing. Um, so those are two of the action steps that I would like to suggest for now. Thank you so much, Stella. Does the committee have uh, follow-up questions? Okay. Um, so, Anne, I see your hand up, um, but then I would be coming to you twice. So I just want to give anyone else an opportunity first, and I promised Stephen I'd go back to him a second time. So I'll do that, and then I'll come back to you if no one else would like to speak at this point. But let me, any other hands? Okay, seeing none. Oh, we have one. I can I can see a hand, but I cannot see your name. So I, uh, it looks like uh, Mary. If you can see the name, uh, it's D V O R A J O N A S. Could you please unmute her or them? Thank you. You have the floor. Hi, um, I'm new to Mount Pelier, so I don't. I'm mostly here listening, but I do have a question. Um, that I want to ask, which is why use deadly force rather than a taser? Wouldn't that have the same effect of immobilizing someone where there was a, a danger without um, destroying them? That's it. I don't, I don't know enough to ask more. Thank you. Um, does anyone on the committee want to respond to that question? Or, uh, you know, we are not, I, 
uh, we don't work for the police, so we're uh, auditing the police practices. Uh, and uh, Michael Sherman has his hand up to answer this, and he might uh, be able to shed some light on that at this point. Michael. Some of you may recall that I think it was four or five years ago, the police chief did come forward with a suggestion that the, the force, the officers um, carry tasers. Um, a committee, uh, there was a lot of um, disagreement about that, and uh, the, the council appointed a, a committee um, that brought in a, a negative report on tasers. Um, the chief uh, at that point withdrew the request, and that's where it stood. Now, that's five years ago. Um, whether there's a, an appetite to reconsider that, I have no idea. It would be interesting to know, but... Um, we are. We have. We have been looking at alternatives uh, to uh, use of force in, in some in in some specific things, um, but just so that you know that it is something that has been discussed at least once in recent in recent years and could be discussed again. Thank you, Michael. And for folks who are just arriving. Uh, the way that this is working is that people who would like to speak. Uh, are using the raise hand function in Zoom. So if you go down to the bottom bar on Zoom and you click reactions, you should see a little button that says raise hand, and then you will become visible to me on my screen and I'll be able to call on you to speak. And for those folks who maybe are having problems with that, you can just wave in the camera or you can chat Mary Smith uh, and she'll help me get you heard. Uh, we are also periodically unmuting the phones so that folks can speak that way as well. Okay, so let's move over to Bill Frazier. Hi, sorry, I, I wasn't planning to speak and I won't offer any comments other than to um, follow up with what Michael just said. Um, and I actually believe it was more like eight or nine years ago, Michael, I know time flies, but uh, Mayor Hooper was the mayor at that time. And we've had at least, I think, seven or eight years of, of other mayors since she went out of office. So uh, I, could get, I can get the exact dates in the committee report and some of the information if the committee wants to take a look at that. But, but uh, you are correct. There was a proposal from the PD to have teasers. There was a fair amount of community pushback. We comment some of what we heard and um, the decision was made not to go forward. Thank you. Any questions for Bill on that? By committee members. I have a question. Bill, do we have a current standing policy where we cannot use tasers in the city? Is, we there, don't a, is there a policy? So we, we don't, don't own have, them, but we don't we don't have them. Um, we had drafted a, a policy in the event that we were going to use them. Um, but we we don't have it now. Um, you know, Ver, Vermont State Police were carrying them. I'm not sure if they still are. Um, and I, I believe Barry City Police carry them and some of the others. So I, you know, there's a possibility if we had a major event and out of, you know, we had assistance from other communities that they would uh, use a taser in accordance with their own policies. It hasn't happened, but Montpelier Police don't own or carry them. And they were the- Thank you. At the time of that event, um, I think just so people are clear, there were only two officers on duty and only four in the entire Washington County, uh, the other two being from Barry City. Um, so there wasn't really backup coming with other issues. Thank you. Any other questions for Bill on, on this? Okay, let's move over to Stephanie. Stephanie, did you have a question for Bill? Or yeah, did you well, wanna speak? No, well, both, I guess, but I, I can do this first. I think, I don't know if Devora was referring to this, but it seems like she was saying instead of guns, not like in addition to, or not that tasers are so great, but like at least as an option of non-deadly force. And then, I mean, obviously that wouldn't really solve all our problems seeing as like, you know, George Floyd was murdered by someone's knee and that there was no weapon involved at all. So it's not, I mean, I wouldn't advocate for like any kind of force that's deadly, but I, I just feel like tasers in addition to guns isn't really what we were wondering about, or at least I wouldn't have wondered about that. I would have wanted tasers instead of guns. Not that I want that, I'm just saying. It, it doesn't seem like, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if that's what she was asking or not. 
So uh, if I may, um, most departments that do have tasers carry them in addition to guns and they, they are considered less lethal um, and they use them in times that are appropriate let a, that um, they would diffuse a situation. Uh, that's still a judgment call and they're still, uh, they have a, limp, a range. I don't know enough about this case to know whether that was out of range, whether a taser even could have been used uh, in that situation. But um, we do have what's called less lethal. We have, uh, I think Steve referred to it earlier, uh, a beanbag launcher, which shoots kind of beanbags, which knocks somebody down or out. Um, but again, you have to have it with you and again, it has a certain range. I'm not advocating for or against tasers. I'm not, you know, trying to advocate for anything. I was just trying to answer the question about, about the time frame of tasers and how it came to be that we don't have them. Uh, that's a whether to have them is a debate for another day. Okay, thank you. Jack, and then Aruna, and then Steve. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the taser question. Um, I think it is a, it's a complicated question. It's, um, uh, it's not at all an easy one to answer. Uh, the company used to refer to it as non-lethal force. There, it's now being referred to as less lethal force because it's very clear that uh, the application of tasers can be lethal under a number of circumstances. If we got a lot of uh, study in the legislature several years ago when uh, someone was in a crisis and was uh, uh, shot by a taser, shot with a taser and killed because of it. And it's certainly possible that that can happen, particularly for someone who has uh, certain pre-existing medical conditions. Uh, I was not at the count on the council at the time it was being considered in uh, Montpelier, but I was one of the people speaking out against uh, using uh, deploying uh, tasers and. Uh, Things can change, things can certainly be looked at, but it's, it's certainly not possible to uh, say as, a, as an easy answer that if we go to TASER, that, uh, that solves the problems that uh, people are perceiving now. Do committee members, any committee members have follow-up questions for Jack? Okay, hearing none, we'll move over to Aruna. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, actually, this is Suresh Murthy. I'm Aruna's husband. How are you? Uh, Welcome. How are, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I, I just wanted to kind of uh, speak for two minutes to appreciate the great work from one of your officers, um, Diane Matthews. Um, she was excellent. She, I had an issue, somebody vandalized my car and um, she uh, actually called me herself, reported the problem, uh, filed a complaint for me, and um, eventually tracked down the suspects. So uh, I was really amazed that you know she took all this effort and uh, without uh, kind of me um, com making the complaint myself, because I didn't know there was a damage to the car until she called me herself. She um, reported the uh, matter and then resolved it and actually got me uh, reimbursed for the damages. So I, I think that was wonderful, great work uh, by her and I really appreciate uh, some of the things. Uh, and, I, I, and this is, you know, I, I lived in a bigger city before, so I'm, I'm really amazed at, um, you know, the uh, attention to detail and how the, uh, the police department here has um, helped me, uh, actually. I, I have nothing but praises for them. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Follow-up questions from the committee. Okay, moving over to C. We just need, um, oh, Hello? there you are, okay. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, just to follow up with the tasers, um, you know, it sounds like, 
So tasers work like 50% of the time. You don't, you don't bring a taser to a gunfight. You don't bring a taser to a knife fight. Um, that's basic police protocol one-on-one. Um, sounds like a lot of people haven't watched the video with Mark Johnson. Some people have. Um, I would say that with a guy, you know, they, in my opinion, watching the video multiple times, you know, he waved that gun around for five minutes straight over and over, you know, flagging the police over and over, uh, flagging cars that were passing by. Um, there's only so much you can do in certain situations, you know, and, um, you know, in, in many, you know, I've watched thousands of videos, you know, body cam videos over the years and, they gave they gave him so many opportunities, you know, to drop the gun. They asked him, they pleaded. Uh, you don't bring a taser to that kind of instance because they obviously didn't know the gun wasn't loaded. It looks real. Um, you know, I would just really, um, you know, I'd ask people, I would ask just people to go watch the video if you haven't. You know, just educate yourselves on on uh, exactly what happened. You know, I still know a lot of people in Montpelier who think that he had a knife. He didn't have anything in his hands, things like that. So I would just, you know, ask everybody to, you know, watch these videos, watch thousands of police videos uh, and start to develop an opinion based on a lot of different information versus just a few separate instances, you know. Uh, and again, the tasers, it's just one of those things where they, you can't, you can't ask an officer to, risk his life over something that might work 50% of the time when it comes to a knife or a gun. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other points I could bring up, but I'll, I'll pass it, pass it along for other questions. Thank you. Follow-up questions by the committee. Uh, I have a question on that one. Um, mm -hmm. say that, the murder was justified based on the video that you saw? Are you asking me if I think that or were you yeah. continuing? Yeah, that, that's my question. Um, absolutely. You know, he, you know, he clearly pointed the, the weapon towards him at the end there when he, when he did shoot. That's even with the grainy footage, that's clear as day. And there was multiple times, there was at least two times where they, uh, there was at least two times in the video where they talked about him flagging them. And, you know, it was a dangerous situation. There's no way around it. Uh, you know, I've seen so many videos where someone didn't get that time of day, you know, where they didn't get five minutes to, you know, to, to wave that gun all over the place. It's an extremely dangerous situation. We all know at the end of the day it was unloaded or it was a fake gun but you can't know that in the moment and when police do get shot man it happens quick it happens in a split second you don't even know what happened um you know i would just again suggest that people watch a ton of body cam video uh, video footage uh there's some good there's some bad there's some in between of course uh, but just to get a better idea of how fast when things do go south how fast they go south and you know, uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned on, on all ends when it comes to watching, you know, all those videos. When it comes to watching those videos, too, you know, going on social media and watching a 15-second clip that's edited and clipped does not do justice to a full 15, 20, 30-minute video as well. Um, there's a lot of sites we can go to to, to watch this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other follow-ups, Abby, before I go to Jack for his follow-up question? That was my only question. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. Okay, Jack? Thanks. I would just uh, ask if we could ask the speaker to uh, identify himself. Uh, it's helpful because we're making a record of, uh, of the proceedings. My name's Colin. Any Sorry, other questions? Good. Nope, go ahead. Colin, did you have something else? No, that was it. I was just, I didn't know if you heard me. Okay, thank you. Anyone else?
Okay. Well, Stephen Whitaker, I'm coming back to you. Can we please unmute Stephen and we will hear from him again. And then Anne, we're coming over to you after that. And then I'll open it back up. Okay. Uh, Steve Whitaker again. So I had tried to uh, en enlist some of the other folks, uh, some young people who have been, uh, had many interactions with the police and feel harassed as well as Casey, who is well known to most folks, uh, a, a troubled and challenged homeless person, uh, you know, would shout and drink and whatever, lived in the park until the parks department demolished his, his camp uh, and, part, and couldn't salvage it before it all got thrown away in the dumpster and the city had done little to nothing to make, make him whole. But Casey, was the victim of what I call collusion, where his father, very intrusive, overbearing father, uh, colluded with the Montpelier police to trump up some charges and have him uh, arrested, detained, and uh, put into a psychiatric involuntarily, involuntary hold. And that does more damage. I mean, there was already a damaged relationship, and now it's 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 more damaged. It's it, as well as more damaged the trust with the police department and, and Casey. So I think that's something that needs to be investigated further. I think maybe Justin or somebody could interview him personally uh, and, and try to get more into that. I want to make a point that I am not an advocate for abolition or uh, elimination or defunding recklessly. I think the police serve an important role it's just not right-sized for our community. Uh, I think accountable, transparent, and right-sized should be our kind of operative principles in, in, in our investigation here. Um, this, we should be designing an intentional transition to a realm of public services and public safety services that are more tuned to the needs in the community, the needs of the mentally ill, the needs of the homeless, the needs of the, tra the transitory, you know, long trail hikers, whomever. Uh, but instead, what we've got is this overbearing, you know, overstaffed and over expensive system. Uh, but I do not think we should be, I, I'm not pursuing this in a punitive, I'm pursuing this, I'm pursuing this more in a, you know, revealing and, and kind of whistleblower, uh, no pun intended, uh, role. Um, so I've covered Casey. I was arrested uh, for going to a meeting of the 911 board as we were designing the 911 system. How ironic is that? And I was on serving on two of the subcommittees, and somebody tried to hold a meeting that should have been an open meeting, and I entered the meeting. And Sergeant Martin at the time came and dragged me down the stairs of the building where DMV is, uh, refusing to double lock the cuffs so that they kept tightening on my hands. That's just violent assault, and the city really should have been have been uh, held to account for that. Later, Officer Long. Uh, was stealing a shelving unit that m M&M and Beverage had given to me, and I, I had arranged to come back for it later. When I get there, Officer Long is putting it in his truck and saying, possession is 90% of the law. You know, And I'm like, this is a police officer working on a public salary? So I was just shocked at that kind of... Um, a decision was made by Chief Fakos to eliminate our uh, call answering for 911 calls. Uh, for years, we had answered calls. It's called single stage, where the emergency calls are answered right where they're also dispatched. And a decision was made. I don't have the history of what how involved the council was in that decision, but we basically gave up the the most safe and most important uh, and most efficient call answering system, which is a single stage dispatch, where the call the 911 calls are automatically routed to the local PSAP or public safety answering point and dispatched at the same place. No delays, no waiting for Williston to transfer a call to Montpelier, et cetera. We need to explore restoring that because the ownership, uh, the the control, the pride of being somewhat, you know, uh, in charge of your own destiny and, and accountable uh, 
is is important. Uh, I believe we are currently operating something as poverty is a is a bias. You know, we we talk a lot about a lot of folks talk about you know indigenous and black and Chinese etc. But we've got a situation where someone's economic status is is used to justify a bias and a mistreatment by our officials, and that's just that's unconscionable. And uh, so I've also noticed that since I've been speaking out about these issues, especially since the Mark Johnson shooting, that some of the cops that used to be, you know, friendly, collegial, cooperative, you know, could share intelligence with or, you know, something to watch out for, something that needs somebody who needs help, they've all clammed up. It's like this blue wall of we're going to protect our, you know, officer, no matter whether, you know, anyway, you, you get my point. The, the idea that we're going to have loyalty to the force rather than to the public is is misguided and needs to be addressed head on and and not used as a as a shield, especially when they know they might be covering up a reckless uh, and dangerous uh, officer. Uh, thank, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to jump in because to move on to others, but we'll come back to you again. Pause. Let's pause just here and see if any committee members have questions about what Stephen just shared. Okay, seeing none, we are um, moving over to Anne, and then we'll, uh, we're, in the, we're in the second round here. So we'll move over to Anne, and then back to Colin, and then over to Stephanie. And if anyone who hasn't spoke is interested in speaking, please do raise your hand, and we'll come right over to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, sort of underscore Stella's point when I asked in what way the committee was representative. Um, I heard that you're making outreach to the LGBTQ community and you're making outreach to communities of color, but you really need actual constituents on your committee who belong to these groups. Um, and I full identification, I'm, I'm a white lesbian, cisgendered, member of the community and um, my name is Ann Charles and I raise this point over and over because it's not good enough. My guess is that you're all white, cisgendered and straight and that's not good enough. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. I can assure you that that is not the case, um, but I don't want to identify, I, people should self-identify if they feel comfortable doing so, but it is not the case that everyone on the committee um, is is cisgender and um, not engaged. You know, I'm I'm not going to qualify how people identify on the committee. Yeah, so we'll just I'll just let I'll just let people self-identify and we'll leave it at that. Um, moving over to Stephanie. Oh no, sorry, Colin, and then Stephanie, and then we're over to you, Bogdan. Uh, hi, Genius. Uh, just want to comment on the uh, police being overstaffed, overused comment, I think, by what was the gentleman's name was uh, Steve, I think. Um, I mean, what do we have? One, two, maybe three officers on at a time. I think we usually have two. And then if we're lucky, you know, on a Saturday night, maybe we have three. If we get one call and two officers show up to that, and then we get a second call, you're calling in Barry City PD to come in and help. That's taxpayer dollars. As far as, I mean, I could be wrong here, but as far as I'm aware, that's whenever they call Barry PD to come back them up or to come take a call in Montpelier, that's taxpayer dollars we're wasting. Um, bottom line is having two or three officers on any shift is not, not overstaffed by any means. You know, if I'm in need in Montpelier, something happens, uh, I want to have an officer there as soon as possible, not coming from Barry. And, uh, you know, I think, so that, that point's pretty clear for, for, for me. Um, and the other thing is, I think that the police have been extremely transparent with everything they've done. You know, everybody's talking about the Mark Johnson shooting and what's happened since then. Um, during that, everything happened to a T, exactly how they reported. You know, there's nothing in that entire incident where they reported something falsely uh, ever since then, especially with Chief Pete coming on. I, I mean, Tony Falcos was very progressive. Uh, he was a great chief. 
uh, Chief Pete, uh, I haven't met the, the man himself, uh, but he seems extremely uh, committed to helping our community. Um, I think it's delusional to think that a community can survive without police, like the, abol the abolitionists in the group. Uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I think that's, you know, uh, you know, there's no way around it. If there's no police, there's, there's mayhem. I mean, even just looking across the country right now, you look at cities like Portland, New York City, Seattle, you're seeing with, with some of these, uh, with, with some of these new, uh, like uh, Portland PD, for example, got rid of their uh, crime prevention unit, and you know, murders, violent crimes have skyrocketed over there ever since. Uh, same in New York City, they did the same thing. Crime is way up. Violent crime, I should say, is way up. Um, we should look at the country and. Watch what you know. If if if, if say Minneapolis, you know that's backfiring too right now. They just spent six million dollars to, to get more police back in their city. Um, St. Petersburg is experimenting with some stuff. The tri-state area is experimenting with uh, uh, I forget what they what they call the unit, but it's uh, uh, state traffic stops or you know unarmed for unarmed traffic stops. I forget what they call the the. Uh, that unit, but um, you know, I think it's great to experiment with showing up to mental health calls, you know, without police, right? Showing up to traffic stops, I think is extremely dangerous, but there's places doing it and experimenting with it. We should watch for a couple of years and see what happens in these cities. So far, it's not looking good, but over a couple of years time, let's, let's watch, see what happens and then adopt the good things and that may occur, right? Maybe some of these things are great, then we can adopt them. But why would you jump on the boat with, you know, right out of the gate with, before just watching and observing? We don't have a problem here. So why don't we watch and wait and see what happens in some of these big cities and, and adopt the things that do well and get rid of the things that don't do so well, right? Um, but I think they've done a really good job in this town uh, especially on Facebook and stuff of just being very transparent about uh, all the reports that have come in, how they're dealing with them. Um, I think they've done a good job. Their PR has been good. Uh, if anyone disagrees, you know, that's go ahead and disagree. But I think personally, I think they've done a fantastic job. I think that's it. Uh, follow up questions from the committee for Colin. No. Okay. Um, one thing I will add to Anne's question, because Anne, um, everyone in the committee does identify as white. And so uh, I did want to talk just for a minute or two about the outreach that we've done to engage uh, folks of color. And then we'll move on to the next uh, person who's going to be the order of Stephanie, Bogdan, then Shana, then Meredith, uh, then Stella. Uh, and when this committee was formed at the beginning, we asked the city council, could we do additional outreach to add, add members because we were not representative of you know, all constituencies we'd like to have at the table. And we got the answer, yes, that we could. And so we did outreach to um, multiple folks um, and asked them to join, including um, a few different people of color and got, um, and we're and we're told no, and uh, so have engaged in other ways. But the reason why uh, the three folks we asked to join the committee, who were folks of color, gave for saying no, was that this year of racial reckoning has been exhausting, and for um, folks of color in Montpelier, uh, the feeling was that, like we heard from all three people. We are so overtaxed. We are asked to join every committee again and again because there's so few people of color and we are exhausted. And this might be a good opportunity for white people to do the hard work in service to us and to stay engaged with us as long, you know, along the way. And so, um, though we weren't able to secure someone from the committee, I I just want to say I and I think committee members share this feeling that 
this, the work that we're doing has to engage with historically marginalized community in a, communities in a very deep way for it to be successful. And so we have had to take other approaches to get that, to bring that perspective in um, through individual interviews, um, surveys, and then also in partnership with the social justice com uh, committee here in Montpelier and through creative discourse is really important work creating BIPOC and LGBTQ and other affinity spaces um, where people can speak confidentially and openly about their experience with the police as folks of color. And so we're bringing those themes into this process as one. And then in addition to that, uh, after we do our draft set of recommendations, we will put those out publicly for people to react to and reach out to the BIPOC community, as well as the unhoused community and the mental health and disability community and many other LGBTQ community to say like, what are we missing? Because our identities color our experiences and given the committee can only take um, those identities so far. So I just wanted to offer some of that additional context um, for, for you, Anne, in your question, but I will stop talking now and move on to Stephanie. You have the floor. Well, first of all, um, the person, Colin, sounds like he is a member of the law enforcement and he doesn't have to answer that, but that just seems really clear to me and it's kind of weird and I wish he would have given his last name as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that yeah, what well, Alyssa, that's exact that's a great point. I was thinking like why would these people want to join the committee if they're so bogged down with these things in their daily life? And I get that. But what concerns me is if all this outreach is being done, like are you gonna listen to any of it? And I don't mean like you personally, sure you might think it's insightful and hmm, that's a good point. But is anything actually gonna come of this? You know, I'm not dismissing the effort at all. I'm just really expecting something to come from it that's beyond just another report that goes to city council that city council could then be like hmm, we did research but now nah, we're not ready like it just it's just really discouraging to think about how many committees in well across the country but in Burlington have been formed and here too and and how many reports have been written how many surveys have been taken how much data has been collected but there's not a willingness to actually change anything I would like to hear from members of the committee like one concrete thing they actually think they could accomplish and convince city council to implement or just like one thing that they actually see being able to change because I'm not expecting abolition from this process even though I am an abolitionist and I do believe that if we invest in community services there won't be a need for people to commit crimes I do believe that and I don't think it's idealistic to believe that I think it's true and there are examples of this and we all know that this is true but besides that I'd like to know from the committee what do you expect is actually going to come from this I'd be really sad if this was just another empty process, just another performative thing. And yeah, I don't have a problem with the fact that it's only white people on the committee because I get that like, we should be doing this work. And that's, that's I think that's a good thing. I just don't want us to then listen to all these people and not do anything with what they're telling us. Another thing is like, we didn't need to gather data from anyone to know this stuff already. You know, like we already know, we know because of what people are telling us who are our friends or family members. We know because of what our friend from high school or our someone's teacher was posting on Facebook. We know from social media, we know from like around the country and we know from in Montpelier what people are dealing with. So we shouldn't need any kind of systematized data collection or, or survey collection or, or any kind of studies to just know. <laughs> like this outreach is kind of, it's anyway, we, we know these things and why aren't we just listening to people when they're telling us? And then I guess my third point, other than being skeptical. Oh, oh yeah, I guess also like, if you could talk a little to the process of the of this whole committee and, and what will happen, like does, does then the report go to city council and then, and what would happen from there? I would like more clarity on that. And the last thing was that I think there's this weird like dual thing where we have people are, really exceptionalist about Montpelier like we don't have the problems of policing that other cities do we don't have racist police here we don't have these problems yet there's weirdly no exceptionalism around crime rates because like actually there aren't that many crimes here and I just think it's so weird that I I'm not trying to undermine the crimes that do occur or I just think it's so strange that we're like we don't have any problems with policing but we have so much crime we need to be kept safe really safe we really need police everywhere they're actually, the crime rate is not that high here compared to like in New York City, obviously. But also why are we, 
right. not willing to just believe one person who's afraid of the police or one person who's harmed by the police or the family of one person who was killed by the police. But we have to just take into account everyone's feelings about potentially being in a crime at some point in their life when quite likely their conception of crime is like from law and order and isn't going to happen to them. I'm just saying there's this ridiculous double standard around how safe Montpelier actually is and how unsafe it is for people in f facing law enforcement. That's all. Thank you, Stephanie. I see committee members want to answer and engage um, on this topic. So why don't I go to Dan and then I'll go on to Justin. And if other committee members want to answer you or ask clarifying questions, we'll open it up to them as well. Uh, yes, uh, Stephanie, first of all, I wanted to just thank you for all of your comments and questions. And, and uh, I have a comment, but before I say something, can can you uh, provide an example, Stephanie, of something that you would feel um, would be meaningful change that, 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 that at the end of the day, if the committee came out with a report and implemented it, you'd feel like, yes, we've, we've done something worthwhile? Hmm. Well, committing to remove certain functions from the police and put them onto non-armed officers, um, committing to reducing the police budget, committing to remove an officer. Uh, those are just some, some of them. Burlington has done a really good job. Well, the city has not done a good job of implementing it, but all the racial justice advocates have done a good job of proposing all these things. And any of those three would be starting points. I don't know. I mean, I. I've written quite a bit about this in various places, but those are what come to mind at the moment. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. And your, your first point was, was the comment I wanted to make. As, as a, uh, a person with lived mental health experience, as well as someone who, who advocates for the disability and homeless community, um, I personally am very committed in this process to looking at, at the um, the the most person-centered, least invasive, least violent, least incarcerative types of solutions to dealing with our, our law enforcement issues and crisis response issues. Um, you know, the, the example Stephen gave of, of uh, 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 remember the community being forced into, you know, according to the story, forced into an inpatient psychiatric situation uh, to me, that that's not that's not an ideal uh, solution, and that we and as we mentioned earlier, there are models in Eugene, Oregon, uh, a program uh, using social workers, uh, Denver, all across the country. There are a number of of solutions where either alternative police to response or co-responders can come in and um, and and take. A, a, a much less or totally nonviolent, non-coercive approach. So, um, I guess you know what I wanted. To, part of what I wanted to comment is, I'll be very disappointed at the end of the day if if the report that we present, if you, Stephanie, don't see see things in that report that you say yes, there's meaningful change. I'll be very disappointed if we don't do that um, as a committee because I, I'm looking at this as an opportunity for uh, making some really you know, meaningful change and looking at and taking a visionary approach and then figuring out what makes sense, um, you know, given the realities of, of uh, the budget and, and other issues um, influencing um, our ability to, to move forward. Thank you, Dan. Let me move over to other committee members who might have follow-up questions or comments for Stephanie. Justin? Hey, Stephanie. So I just want to address the outreach part and how important the outreach part is to me. Like, I understand the point that, yes, we know all these things in the sense that like, we have a lot of anecdotal and uh, we just have a lot of data regarding uh, the ideas, the general ideas behind like, defunding the police and abolishing the police. For me, and I know for at least one other committee member, 
the importance of outreach has to do with the fact that policing most certainly is not a one size fits all approach. And it is, if anyone who has worked within the criminal justice system, my background is as a criminal defense and civil rights attorney, it, you know that you see different challenges in different places in different communities. And for me, it's been very eye opening the outreach because I've gotten feedback that I did not expect from certain individuals um, and some feedback that I did expect. And I think it's really important that this particular committee tailors its recommendations to Montpelier because that is our charge. We're not charged with saying, oh, what are best practices in policing in America in the year 2021? It's what is best in Montpelier? And that's why the community, the specific community member engagement is so important. And the last thing that I will say for a lot of people here, and I think hopefully this will resonate when we, when we are able to release the report, is I do think there is a very big disconnect that you're implying here about um, the exceptionalism in Montpelier and that everything is wonderful. Because I walk down the street and it feels like everything is wonderful to me, but it is quite clear that it is not to everyone. And that's, that's been one of the big takeaways for the feedback or for the outreach. Um, lastly, I will say, sometimes you just learn things in outreach that you wouldn't expect. Stephen has all of these ideas around dispatch. And then we talked to Ken Russell the other day and about, um, about emergency response and like essentially a triage point that would send someone other than the police to certain, um, to, to certain mental health crises. And, like, and there are challenges regarding like, well, who do you staff at that triage point? Like, what is their training? Things along those lines. It's a very complicated question. It's a very, very complicated question, but I promise you that we are thinking about it and we are doing the work and that we're gonna try. So that's all I got. Thank you. Other, do other committee members have questions or comments related to Stephanie's engagement here? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we are gonna move over to uh, Bogdan next and then to Shana. Hey, thank you. So I just wanted to thank Colin for throwing some uh, much needed facts into this conversation. Uh, the last I spoke with the Montpelier police officer, he told me that the phones are ringing nonstop. So I guess my question would be, or my curiosity would be, how, what percentage of those calls could be answered or directed to a non-officer, like a social worker? Uh, I think the, this would be really important before we, you know, before we judge if they are and overstepped or overfunded or understepped or underfunded uh, the amount of police related calls that they are that they are asking also the the gentleman that uh, said that there was a father that colluded uh, the police to get their kid arrested i find this one of the worst thing a cop could do so i would i would really encourage this gentleman to throw to put some facts forward because if a cop did that they would definitely need to lose their job uh, for doing something like that and lastly, I totally agree with Stephanie that we should really invest in the community. Uh, would this reduce crime? Most likely and most definitely. However, we would be remiss not to acknowledge that there's evil out there and there are people out there that will do harm and they will do harm no matter what the government would do for them. And we would all be fools to, to ignore history on, on this. So thank you. Thank you. Follow-up questions for Bogdan by committee members. Okay, uh, seeing, seeing none, we're moving over to Shana, then Meredith, then Stella. Hi, my name's Shana Casper on 10th Street. Um, and I just, this is the first I've heard um, from Bill Frazier about uh, the increase over the past uh, decade or less of about four police officers to about 16 police officers. And I was wondering if, um, if you could, if, uh, how that number also, you know, uh, goes with the population of Montpelier during that time, and with the number of state troopers um, who are, you know, out of the Middlesex district um, or are based in Montpelier. I'm not sure how the how the you know state trooper numbers work, um, but that was just the first I've heard of that, and I'm interested in learning more. Bill, are you willing to answer that question or able? Um, I think so. What well, she said there was an, I, I couldn't tell if you asked there was an increase of four or what What you meant, Shana. No, I think you said that in about eight years ago, eight to 10 years ago, there was four police officers and now I believe there's 16 or 17. No, 
if, if you heard that, uh, I drastically misspoke. What I believe I said, so is I've been here in my job for 26 years. And in my time, the police department has ranged between 15 and 17 officers. It goes up and down, but it's never really changed drastically in, in size uh, in that, that difference. We're currently at 16. Um, and that, and well, assuming they're all full, we've got some vacancies. So there has not been, what I said about four officers was at the time of the Mark Johnson incident, there were four officers in the entire Washington County on duty. There were two in Montpelier and two in Barry City, and that was it. There were no state police, no other local officers on duty. So I'm sorry if, if that was misunderstood. I Is that you were referencing not the Mark Johnson incident, but in, uh, when we're discussing the tasers um, and when so the so what I said was happening. What I said was the tasers, it was about eight or 10 years ago that that discussion about tasers happened and there was a decision not to be made. I don't believe I referenced the size of the police department at that time. Uh, if I did, um, must have been a senior moment because I don't remember saying it and I, I don't think I would, because it certainly wasn't the case. The numbers have been, we, we have not expanded really the police department or cut, it's been just stable the whole time. And then do you know about the state police officers um, I don't know. Are... If, well, I know that in the evening, there's typically one on duty till about 2 a.m. For the, for the entire county. I don't know what their day shifts are uh, and you know who's actually doing patrol. I also know some communities contract so with state police to do specific like speed patrols and same with sheriffs. So there may be occasionally other people on doing certain work. I, I don't have the profile of that. That would be a good, I mean, that's a data point the committee could collect. Um, but I know at, in, in, at nighttime, um, there might be one. So, uh, you know, if you talk, and again, I hate to get into anecdotes, but if you talk to people who live outside of Montpelier who have to make a, a police call in the middle of the night, they often don't get a response from state police for a day or two. It's not that they get an immediate call. Um, just, you know, if, if someone could be in Plainfield and the police could be over in Warren or Waitsfield, and uh, it's just, that's the way the state police. So it's just the way it works. The other police departments, um, Berlin, I believe, goes off at 2 a.m. And I think, I'm not sure about Barrytown. I'd have to check that. I don't think they're 24 hours. But, um, or maybe they just are on weekends or something like that. We've had, we, have, we have had cases, and I don't want to take up time with me talking, but we've had cases where we've got calls to these other communities in those off hours when no one else was on duty. State police was unavailable. And then we're in a situation of do we respond to a community that has not staffed their police department um, and leave ours empty and it's potentially dangerous calls. Um, I mean, they usually are dangerous calls when we get asked to assist at that time. So those are tough decisions. But anyway, I, I'm digressing from the key point, which is our department has been 15 to 17 people for the last 25 years. And the taser incident was eight to 10 years ago. And there were four people on duty in the entire county at the time of the Mark Johnson shooting. There. I hope I've covered it. I just have one more question about that. Does that yeah. include dispatchers? Well, they they can't respond. No, that doesn't include dispatchers. So there's usually uh, one or two on. Um, that time, uh, the overnight shift, it's typically only one. Uh, there can be three on at certain times as the dispatch supervisor. On. Obviously, we try to staff to the busy times, but they can't leave. They can't, they can't provide on-site assistance. They would be calling for additional help. Um, and obviously, they're the lifeline for the officer. But... I think one of the questions was about the res the number of people that responded and who was available to respond to that call. There were no mental health workers oh, on and, and those kinds of things. So I think it's 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 good to understand the facts on the ground of that case. And I think one of the things the committee's been asked to look at is could that modeling be different so that there are more people available and different kinds of people available at different times of the day. So I don't, I'm not trying to make judgments. I'm just trying to make sure people have the accurate information. Hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up questions for Shana. Okay, thanks, Shana. Um, so for folks who are just joining, because I see there's a couple of new folks who have just joined, I just wanna reiterate how the process is going for you. I, so if anyone wants to speak, People are doing the, using the raise hand function in the bottom of the Zoom bar where it says reactions. You just click that button and then you click raise hand and then you'll be visible to me on my screen. 
um, and, and we'll get you in the queue. For folks who are on the phone, I know you can't do that. So we're just gonna open up the phone lines every now and then and say, does anyone wanna speak on the phone? We're going through everyone who wanted to speak who hasn't spoken first, and then we're going back to people a second time. If someone wants to speak a third time, and we do have a couple people who are interested in that, I moved you down to the bottom of the queue so that we can get the new people who have recently come in uh, time instead. And then we will get, I'm, I bet we will still get back to you. We're, we're here until 6.30, but, um, but that's how this has been running. Uh, Meredith, I see you've taken your hand down. So going once, I going can, twice. I could, I could take just a second. Um, I wanted to mention a constituency that hasn't been mentioned, which is children and teens. Um, the incident that happened at the state capitol in January where the young woman was surrounded by a group of Trump supporters, um, the ways in which that was discussed in the press as well as the um, releases that were um, put out by the, our police department um, seem to indicate a lack of understanding of especially the teenage brain and normal developmental behavior uh, for young people of that age and how to um, support them. And I hope that uh, part of what this committee is doing is really looking at um, effective ways to be in community and support young people um, in ways that aren't just punitive and that aren't um, persistently in this kind of top-down model, which, you know, children are frequently marginalized uh, by adults. And I think it's really important that we think about them as whole humans um, and, and have a real understanding of where they are in their development and how to uh, be supportive of them in community. Thanks. Thank you. Follow-up questions for Meredith or comments by committee members? No, okay. Um, Meredith, I completely agree. And it, the SRO process and robust conversation in this community has really engaged teens in this issue of policing and how it intersects with their lives. That's just one example. You've given a couple others of how teens are in engaging with police. Uh, but I, I do think it's an area we need to be doing um, additional outreach around and are, um, and are planning, on, planning on doing that and using the work of the SRO committee to figure out the best model because of their mm -hmm. um, robust engagement already. So just wanted to share that with you. We're moving over to uh, Stella and then Al and then Sean and then Casey. I've already gone, so you can circle back around to me after people who haven't spoken yet. Okay, thank you, Stella. And we're and just for folks who who are just joining us, we're doing about three minutes per person. And and um, you know, I'm letting it go a little long here and there, but I just I, I will jump in at some point and say, all right, we probably should move on to the next person if you go too much longer than that. So let's move on to Al. Thanks, Alyssa, for facilitating. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to briefly introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> my name's Al. I live on Main Street here in Montpelier. And um, I come from a family where uh, my great grandfather was the first uh, badge state trooper in New Hampshire. Um, and so my family is right now grappling with issues of policing and um, how our family kind of approaches these issues um, because we also have family members who have been, who've experienced abuse at the hands of the police, including the Montpelier police um, and who have been involved and been harmed by the prison industrial complex. So just a lot there. And um, I just wanna bring both of those parts of myself and where I'm coming from around it. Um, <clears throat> I also helped found and on the steering committee of the Vermont Freedom Fund, which is an abolitionist organization <clears throat> that provides bail and bond for community members who are put behind bars um, with a specific immigration focus. We were founded alongside migrant justice. Um, to support their membership, but have expanded to support as well the Women's Justice and Freedom Initiative. Um, and so I, the big thing that I want to say to this committee is that I hope that you all will take a broad view of potential alternatives to policing. 
um, and to not fall into the trap that Burlington experienced in the past couple of weeks. We saw that the you know, report that was commissioned to the tune of $75,000 came out with very few solutions, unfortunately, and did not take into consideration the community feedback they were receiving around uh, ways to move forward together to, um, to deal with policing. And so I'm glad to hear that you all are doing more community outreach to um, to Ken, to Russell, to many others, I imagine. Um, and I just want to offer a resource around this, which is the work of an organization called Critical Resistance, which the Vermont Freedom Fund has um, worked alongside um, extensively. And um, so I just, a few of the things that are offered here, there's a, they offer a great framework that I can share with the committee as a follow-up to understand ways that um, further entrench dangerous policing strategies versus ways that actually um, can help promote community safety through alternatives. And so just a few things as it re relates directly to policing and policy around policing, um, suspending the use of paid administrative leave for cops who are under investigation, um, withholding pensions and not rehiring cops who've been involved in instances of excessive force, capping overtime accrual and overtime pay for military exercises, um, withdrawing participation in any police militarization programs or committing to not engaging in them in the future, and prioritizing spending on community health, education, and affordable housing, as well as overall doing what we can to reduce the size of the police force using creative tactics to activate community members to fulfill some of the needs that armed officers may be responding to right now. Um, I am more than happy to speak with any of you or have a follow-up via email, um, but thanks for the work you're doing. And I hope that this, um, that the work that you all put forward will have much more teeth, much more creative alternatives than we saw in Burlington. So thanks for your work and um, we'll be here. Thank you so much. And uh, Mary's email uh, should be in the chat, but if you wouldn't mind sharing those resources to, with that email to Mary, that would be really wonderful. And if you could also just include your contact information in that communication to Mary, we'll, we would be able to follow up directly. So um, thank you for, for speaking. And then does anyone in the committee have uh, follow-up questions for Al? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to Sean. Sean Stevens. Hi, thank you. So yeah, I'm Sean Stevens. I live here in Montpelier. I've lived here for 22 years. <clears throat> and I'm here to advocate that we divest from um, armed policing and reinvest in community care and community health and affordable housing. I'm just setting myself a three minute stopwatch there. Um, I think that the problem that we run into with armed policing is that police throughout the country and in Montpelier have two forms of corrosive power. That is the power to use violence and the power to arrest people. And people use that power when they have it. And it is it is definitely a corrosive form of power. Throughout the country and in Montpelier, police use that power with impunity. They use it, and in the best of worlds, they're restrained and they use it judiciously. Often they do, but when they don't, there are never consequences. And I'm not saying that as an extrapolation, I'm not exaggerating, there are literally never consequences. Police are never found guilty after an unarmed person is killed. They're never incarcerated. The, the numbers are stark. 15,000 people in the last 10 years have been killed. Unarmed civilians have been killed by police. And there have been five police officers who actually got um, convicted. So 15,000, five convictions. So that form of power means that they have unchecked power. And that corrupts anybody regardless of intentions. So that's one reason. Um, I, have, I have four reasons. Number two, 
The percentage of 911 calls that get dispatched to police that actually require response by a person authorized to use deadly force is minuscule. Even in Los Angeles, which is probably quite a bit more dangerous than Montpelier, the percentage is about 4%. And that's after the LA Times analyzed 17 million calls. Only 4% actually required a response by somebody who is authorized, armed, and equipped to use force. The other 96% would have been better handled by a social worker, a community safety person. So that's, that was number two. The percentage of 911 calls that need an armed response is, is vanishingly small. Number three, the MPD, unsurprisingly, like all police forces, engages in mission creep. Then all of a sudden, they're the ones who get called when there's a stray dog, or when somebody's neighbors are being too loud, or when um, there's an argument, or when there's a homeless person. So that kind of mission creep is a form of, of unacknowledged reallocating away from what we actually need, which is community safety. In other words, an appropriate person to deal with all those problems. And that money is instead getting funneled into the police who are not the right people to deal with those problems. Mission creep, that was number three. Number four, um, police are the line, biggest line item in the budget. It is very expensive to have 17 officers all of whom getting paid quite a good salary compared to like teachers or social workers or other people. So we can increase the number of people working on community safety. We can increase safety for all members of the community and either lower the overall costs or at least not keep them any higher by divesting from police and investing in community care. There are models for this. Brattleboro, Ithaca, New York, Denver, Colorado, Northampton, Massachusetts, we would not have to be trailblazing something brand new. We can do this. We can even also try it for a period. Try it for six months, see what happens. If Bogdan is right and all of a sudden we're overrun by a zombie horde, then I'll say, oh, well, yeah, Bogdan was right. There's a, it's a crazy dangerous world. And, and <clears throat> once, we, once we divested from police, all hell broke loose. But I doubt that that will happen. I think that community safety will be improved if we divest from policing and invest in community care. Oops, I went over, but I'm done. Thank you, Sean. Um, do folks on the committee have follow-up questions for Sean? I'd like to rebuttal Sean on that one. Um, Colin, I'm just gonna just have you hold there because we have a bunch of people who wanna talk and you've been able to talk a few times now. So if you wouldn't mind just holding it, um, we can get you, we can have you in the queue. Um, any just other, any that, committee members want to have clarifying questions for him? Okay, Casey, let's move on to you. I know you haven't had a chance to speak yet, and I noticed that our time, we're just running out of time, so I want to make sure that we can hear your voice. Casey, you're on mute. Let's, Mary, can you unmute Casey, please? I think Zoom disabled that feature. I think Casey. Okay, there we there we go. Does that did that work? Yep, we got you. Okay. Got you. Go ahead. All right. Well, I am the one that Steve was actually talking about earlier. Um, there was a little bit of a there there. I've lived in Montpelier for many years. There was a long-standing situation between my father. Um, Essentially, my father, Washington County Mental Health, and um, Bill Fraser actually, um, they had something of an alliance um, to get me off the street in Montpelier because my father, um, he's extremely misguided and a, a whole lot of other issues that basically he was trying to solve a lot of problems somehow by creating more problems for me. That's really neither here nor there, but I, I felt the need to um, point out who I was maybe and correct the record a little bit because um, Whitaker brought it up. Anyhow, um, I believe that the police department, in addition to maybe coming up with some of the, some of the um, mission creep, um, 
idea that I think it was Sean had brought up. Um, I think that that does obviously come into effect because I, I think that probably is a lot of what happened with me. Um, but at the same time, I, I, there's definitely got to be better ways where we can use our resources, where we can shepherd things um, to a more constructive place. And I, I absolutely believe that that's true, that it has to be. And, um, you know, I know there was a lot of things, there was a lot of things said at one point over um, when there was the homeless committee was um, in effect and really doing more stuff. And we were talking more about, um, um, we were talking more about affordable housing and stuff like that. I don't know if, um, anybody be more interested in going into that kind of thing. I know that was brought up as an alternative um, to policing. I believe that was Al Johnson Kurtz had brought that up at one point. Um, so I, I definitely think that there's a lot of things that can be done and a lot of things, a lot of positive things that can be done. And also, um, also wanted to um, familiarize the committee with me if, uh, because I, it's been a long time since I've uh, been involved at all. Right now, I'm incarcerated in um, the state hospital. Casey, thank you so much for speaking up and being here with us today. I really appreciate that. And um, Casey, would you mind, you, you offered to continue to be in conversation with this committee about your experiences. Would sure. you mind um, sending Mary Smith a direct chat in Zoom with your with your contact information so we could follow up directly? I'm not really sure how to do that. That's kind of the reason that I got like I there was a time I got muted and I couldn't really figure out how to unmute it for a while and stuff. I'm just not very tech savvy. Okay, no problem. We get in touch with Stephen who I know who yeah. can give us your information. Oh, there's Winter. Okay, what's up? Casey, with your permission, I'll pass your contact information to uh, the Justin, right. who's on that on the committee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, right. uh, if uh, you've got a way, Steve, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let me just pause here. We have about you know eight minutes left of this hearing. Has anyone not? Has anyone who wants to speak who has not spoken yet uh, interested in speaking? All right, well, hearing hearing none or seeing no other hands, I'm gonna go back to Stella, then Steven, then Colin, then Bogdan, and you'll close us out. Stella. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly to something that Colin said earlier. I would like to say that as a person who has lived with mental illness since a very young age, being called delusional is extremely harmful. And this is an example of how the committee has the opportunity to make it accessible for people from marginalized identities to join these conversations. So after he spoke and called people in this group delusional, that would be a great opportunity for someone from the committee to speak up and say that that's not the type of speech that will be tolerated in this space. That said, I am willing to engage with you going forward. Um, and I will send Mary my contact information as well, because despite your uh, apparently very widespread outreach, I have not been successfully able to get involved with any of your efforts to reach the communities that I am a part of. Um, so I'm just gonna provide my contact information directly since none of those spaces have been available to me. Um, I filled out application processes through the social justice committee and they never responded in any way. So I'll provide that just directly. Um, but I just wanted to name that, that, that that's pretty harmful um, and just share that with you all so that you can do better going forward. Thank you for providing your information and providing that feedback. That's a great point. I should have caught that. I appreciate it. Um, Steven. Okay, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, I want you to know that I have raised many of these issues over time recurring at city council meetings to no avail. Uh, I can imitate 
uh, Bill's frantic reach for the pen and write it down, but nothing, no discussion, no follow-up has ever happened from any of these issues. So I am thankful that the committee has convened and is taking these matters seriously. I think we're going to end up, and I want to recommend that we go, we head towards an oversight board. Uh, I think Burlington uh, demonstrated the, the potential and the pushback when the the, the council uh, was was voted to create the oversight board, and it was vetoed by the mayor. Uh, I would uh, welcome that opportunity to change mayors here. Uh, Burlington. I witnessed an event on the waterfront where a person who behaved erratically, loud, uh, not threatening, but uh, reminded me a little bit of Casey, uh, but the, the officers responded. They kept their distance. They engaged. They let them know that they were there and available to talk. Otherwise, they stayed at a distance and let this person you know, process their own angst and, and move along and, and without any incident, without anybody being handcuffed or threatened or... It was quite something to see, and I commended the officers on it. Um, the, I guess that's good. That's that's enough for now. Could keep us on time. Thanks. I will follow up with uh, members as needed. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. And why don't we actually just do two minutes for the remaining folks so that we can make sure that we have time for follow up questions if needed. And I see another person's in the queue, Bill, at this point. So, uh, Colin, over to you. Colin, going once, going twice. All right, let's go over to Bogdan. I just want to say thank you for organizing this forum for open discussion. Um, I think there were a lot of great ideas out there, some good, some better, some not so good. Uh, but I do think it's very important for the mind to, to have these engagements where everyone has a different opinion. And also there were some people that spoke about not knowing how they can get involved more. So I, I think you, you guys really blew it out of the park with that. So just want to say thank you and appreciate the, the time that I had to, to, raise, uh, to raise some concerns and to, to share my opinions on this. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, and for folks um, moving forward, uh, just Colin, I hear you're on mute. I'll just come right back Thank to you in a second. But for folks who feel like they didn't get enough time to speak but want to offer more or want to stay engaged, please do email Mary and just say like, hey, I'm, I'm ready for like, I hear some written comments, please interview me or I would like to be engaged and we'll follow up. Um, Colin, why don't I go back to you for uh, a minute or two here and then Bill, you yeah. can close us out. All right, thank you. Um, hey, I, I didn't mean any disrespect to anybody by saying delusional. I just meant in contrast to um, completely abolishing police. I didn't know what other term to use in that circumstance. I wasn't in any way referring to mental illness and stuff. Um, I think Bill made the best point of the day in this entire thing, talking about how there's about two officers on board at, at any given time. And uh, Barry police may have to respond, which takes time. So I think that's a huge point. If you defund police, if that's where any of this is going, that's a huge problem. Um, Sean, I had a question. I think his name was Sean. I think he said 15,000 unarmed people are shot and killed by police in the last five years. Is that what he said? And 10. 10 years? Could I clarify on that? Yeah, 10. That, that's, that is 100% incorrect. Um, so we should double check our stats when we're talking about this stuff for sure. But um, I, I can send the, the committee the stats. No, no, it's 100% wrong. There's about 1,000 people killed per year by police. And then, you know. Hey, uh, you guys, I'm going to just jump in here because as that. we're winding down, I would just ask this. Colin, provide your number to the committee. And Sean, provide your number to the committee. We are totally open to that and would love to see that, but we really don't want to debate this right now in the last two minutes okay. of this time frame. Yeah, I just so want to clarify. Do you have any other final points, Colin, before we move to Bill? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, my question to you, I guess, is what is your, what is, what is your ultimate goal of this committee? Are you trying to, I'm, I'm completely for reform when and where. And my, my terms of reform for police are uh, more training, better training, right? 
more firearms experience and more training, which obviously costs more money. Uh, Jiu-jitsu training. Every cop should be a purple, brown, or black belt in jiu-jitsu for sure. That costs a lot of training. There's a lot of great uh, uh, programs out there right now, like Adopt a Cop, where you can, you know, the community gets together and sends the entire police department, you know, uh, to jiu-jitsu training. Uh, there's, there's amazing programs like that out there. Uh, I don't think defunding provides anything that we are looking for when it comes to reform. I think the more experience, the more training, the better. Um, that's the biggest you know, problem people seem to have is inexperienced officers out there who don't know how to handle a situation, right? In certain, you know, certain circumstances. Um, Colin, let me jump in and answer your question because we're basically sure, yeah. at time and I wanna let Bill, Bill close us out. So our, our committee's goal is, and here's what we're charged with. We are charged with understanding the current police practices defining yeah. best practices for community safety, community safety really broadly, looking at where the Montpelier Police Department is already trying to go, comparing that to best practices, uh, and then making recommendations on gaps or changes that are needed. We're trying to do that because there's so many different policing topics through the yeah, lens sure. of what stakeholders in Montpelier really care about. Um, so, so nice. Bill, why don't I give it over to you to close us out? And I really just want to thank everyone so much for participating in this process. And you know, it's not over yet. We're we still want additional input moving forward. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thank you, and thank you all for this, and, and members of the public and the committee for this conversation. I just wanted to make sure that people were aware, um, since obviously there's a lot of people on here that are interested in the police and their activities, that they are in the midst of a their own outreach, community outreach for uh, crisis intervention training, which is a new, which is a, a, a partnership model dealing with mental health and looking at best practices for that. And those are ongoing now. There is going to be one this Wednesday at 5 p.m. and another one Saturday at noon. And they would like public participants. There's a program there. And so um, they. this is a sort of a new innovation. We would be the first in the state to fully uh, implement this if we go that route. So I want to make sure that folks that have that interest have a chance to participate in those forums. Bill, how, do, how will people know about that? Is it going to be on the city website or like how will they find the information? Yes, it's been on the website. It's been on the Facebook page. I think it's been on Front Porch Forum. Um, so it's, it's in all those places. It's a Zoom link. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. All right, great. Hey, thank you, everyone. I'm going to close this out. And uh, on behalf of the committee, so appreciate your input. And the next um, step here is please look for the community survey that we're going to send around that we hope everyone here and uh, you know many others in the community will take. And we look forward to following up with those folks who are reaching out to Mary. Thanks again so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, folks. Bye, everyone.